I will talk about today will be based on joint work with these four amazing collaborators. Two of them are currently in the audience. So recall from yesterday that we were trying to use a class of theories known as 4D n equals 2 superconformal theories Let's denote a sort of theory by T to get some well-defined 3D T graph T, such that you will have well-defined partition function on all three manifolds. And we realized that we could probably use an S1 isometry acting on its Coulomb branch. And indeed, this helped to regularize partition function on um, um, S1 times S2 sorry, S3 partition function by turning this you define partition function into a rational function in one variable. So, and recall that from last time, we have this simple example where T is a free U1 theory. Then this partition function now become something like 1 over 1 minus t, which is well defined as long as t is not equal to 1. But we also remarked yesterday that you shouldn't expect to do this, in a, do this for all three manifolds in a way that you get a C star family of t graph t's. So you cannot expect to get a sister family of 3D T -type T's by applying this to S1 times M3 with more general M with more general M3. So from the point of view of 3D T graph T, is, um, one should expect this because 3D T graph T are rigid and there is nothing such as a C star family of T graph T that are not constant. And you also expect this from physics, because here you are using this S1 action, and S1 is known as an R symmetry. In the physics literature, and in general, it's not a good idea to use an R symmetry. So what's exactly the geometric meaning of having an R symmetry. Geometrically, this means that the S1 will act on the hypercalar structure. So for example, it will act on complex structures. So recall that given a hypercalar metric, we have a CP1 worth of compatible complex structures. And the 
this S1 will rotate this two sphere in a way that looks like this. And you have already seen this in Hirako's lecture. And this S1 also acts now trivially on the symplectic structures. And um, there's no dry one, right? Okay. And to see this, you can you can first realize that for hypercalar manifolds such as MT, once you fix a complex structure, it will become a holomorphic synthetic manifold. So you will have a homomorphic synthetic form, at omega. And this homomorphic synthetic form also play an important role in this um, um, <coughs> so MT is completely integrable exactly with respect to this homomorphic synthetic form. So you have again this map to BT, the U plane, and the fibers are going to be complex Lagrangians. And this S1 action will rotate the homomorphic synthetic form. So if I parameterize this S1 with the angle between 0 and 2 pi, then it will send omega i to e to i theta times n omega i. And here, if n is larger than 1, then you will actually have uh, the n subgroup inside S1 that fix omega i. And in fact, it will fix uh, the entire hypercalar structure. the meaning of um, this the end from the physical from, from the physical point of view so now you will have um, if, let me erase this you have a short exact, exact sequence that looks like the following so you have your group S1, and then there is the ZN subgroup. And the quotient is something that I will refer to as U1R. And this is exactly the U1R symmetry that appear in Jens' talk. So this is part of the R symmetry. And it acts on um, the supersymmetry algebra in a non-trivial way. In other words, the action of S on the supersymmetry algebra will factorize through this map. The corresponding geometric statement is that this U1R will act on hypercalar st structures.
and the map, the action of S1 on the hypercalic structure will also factorize through this map. So although this U1R is constantly referred to as a U1R symmetry, the true symmetry of the theory is actually S1. So U1 is only realized projectively. So this will be actually a symmetry of the theory T. And correspondingly, this U1R, although it acts on hypercalic structures, is not a symmetry of the Coulomb branch. And S1 acts as isometry on the Coulomb branch. So then, here, this is the end by definition, is a symmetry of the theory that won't act on the supersymmetry algebra. And this is exactly what physicists would refer to as a flavor symmetry. Now it's a discrete flavor symmetry. And from the geometric point of view, this is an isometry of, of M that fixes the hypercalic structure. So it's a triholomorphic isometry. And as I mentioned last time, uh, if there is some canonical discrete flavor symmetry, then there might be some interesting thing that we can do. We can maybe attempt to use this to regularize the partition function. So, then this n will be determined by the theory. And obviously there are two possibilities. The first possibility is that n just equal to one. And uh, then we cannot use this discrete symmetry for anything. The second possibility is that n is larger than one. Then we actually can do something. And I've mentioned many examples that belong to the first class of theories. These include all gauge theories. And all theories of class S. And then for the second class of theory, this has to be uh, non-gauge theories. And they cannot be of class S. But sometimes they are closely related to class S theories. Since all the examples that I have given last time belong to the first class of theories, you may wonder whether there are actually interesting theories that belong to the second class. So let me give you a few. And these examples are known as rank one. Address Douglas theories. Since there is no gauge group, rank one is of course not referring to the rank of the gauge group. Instead, it's referring to the dimension of its Coulomb branch. And in this case, the Coulomb branch all the Coulomb branches are going to be one dimensional. So the base will just look like a complex plane 
with one singularity. And over that, you will have an exceptional fiber. And there are three theories of this type. One is known as the A1, A2 theory. The second one is known as the A1, A3 theory. And the third one is known as the A1D4 theory. And for the first theory, again, if you are away from the singularity, then the fiber is going to be a um, smooth elliptic curve. And then if you move to this particular singular point, then now the fiber will look like this. And again, if you move away from this point, you get a, another smooth elliptic curve. So this singular fiber in Kodaira's classification is known as type two singularity. And the monotony around this singular fiber will be given by the following matrix. For this theory, n would equal to 5. So it actually belongs to the second class. For the second theory, you will have a similar picture. The base is still one dimensional, so it looks like a complex plane, but with a singularity of its uh, special Keller metric. And over this point, you will have a fiber that roughly looks like this. And this is type 3 singularity in Kodaira's classification. And the monotony is given by this particular elements in SL to Z. And for this theory, N would equal to 3. For the last one, again, the base of the vibration looks like this. And over this special point, The singular fiber looks like the following. This is type 4 singularity. And the monogamy is going to be given by 0, 1, minus 1, minus 1. And for this theory, n equal to 2. So you see that there are actually interesting theories um, that belong to the second class. If you go to high rank, then there are many more. Continuous global symmetry. Well, the R symmetry is uh, also global symmetry. It's continuous. But if you're asking for flavor symmetry, I think in this case it's uh, discrete. So in this case it's D5 and D3 and D2. Hmm? Well, um, it's subgroup of S1, and the quotient is E1R. More questions? So you say that there's no way of obtaining this theory from an fiber and with some type of... Oh, um, so, the, so it can be obtained by complexification using a fibering. But now it had to involve uh, irregular singularity. 
And uh, in the definition of class S, I kind of only allow regular singularity to make a slight distinction. And that's why I mentioned that it's actually, some of them are closely related to class S theories. Any other question? So these are the only theory for rank one that has higher n. So for example, if you take Minahan um, Namchensky's uh, E6, E7, or E8 theory, these are some special class I theories, and these all have n equals one. But in higher rank, you have a lot of mm, theories with n equal uh, n being larger than one. So now you may wonder, well, this, uh, these are discrete symmetries. How can you use discrete symmetry to do any kind of regularization? So to understand how to do regularization using discrete symmetry, let's again get back to um, the S3 Hilbert space. Recall that the Hilbert space of the theory on S3 is identified with the space of regular functions on the 4D Coulomb branch BT. And this is already um, twisted theory, so the full theory can. Uh, contain more states in the Hilbert space. And then if you compute the S1, the character of the S1 action, then you will obtain the following quantity. Let me use T again for the equivalent parameter. The S1 character will be given by the following rational function, one over products of one minus t to the dth power and to the nth power. Here, the i's are weights of S1 action on b. And n lines are going to be multiplicities of these weights. And then you may wonder whether you can do something like this. You now set t to be the nth root of unity. and ask whether this quantity is well-defined. If this is well-defined, then you kind of use this discrete symmetry to regularize the um, S1 times S3 partition function. turns out that this will be well-defined as long as your theory has an additional property.
Mm -hmm. Oh, like what's the meaning of this particular label? Yeah, this is something that I didn't mention and was not originally planning to mention. So, but maybe let me still uh, make this remark. So there is um, a family of um, a George Douglas theories. Parameterized by a pair of a D Dinkin diagram. And the data for this pair of AD Dickin diagram is translated into a singular Calabial threefold. This is some particular singular Calabial threefold that um, can be constructed as a singular hypersurface in C4. And you have some explicit. Um, equation that define this hypersurface. And this equation depends on G1 and G2. And then uh, the physics construction of this theory is that you compatify type 2B string theory on this particular singular Calabial threefold. And then you will see that for generic choice of G1, G2, you actually get a theory with n larger than one. So you will be like a geostalgia theory. So does this answer the question? And are there more questions? Over the number of uh, different weights in this decomposition. So maybe let me make a separate remark since I have already made this one. So there is another overlapping family and this family of theories are not labeled by this data but instead a different set of data is labeled by a single G, uh, the algebra of type ADE. And then um, Riemann surface sigma. But now it's topologically has to be just P1. But it can be dark decorated by some marked points. And one of the marked points correspond to an irregular singularity. And one can also possibly allow another regular singularity. So it will look like something like this. And um, then at the north pole of this P1, you have a irregular singularity you can perhaps <laughs> include another regular singularity at the South Pole. So, and the construction for this causal theory is indeed, as Francesco mentioned, uh, you can compatify um, M5 brain on this particular two manifolds. And this leads to Another theory, T in four dimensions. And because there are irregular singularities, um, if you look at the modular space of solution of some BPS equations, there will be Stokes phenomenon. And roughly n is related to the number of Stokes rays. 
So at Hidalgo singularity, there are some Stoke rays, and n is correlated with the number of Stoke rays. Um, okay, but let's um, get back to the question um, of whether this is well defined. It turns out that if the quantum field theory satisfies another condition, then this will be defined. So the condition is that this Zn action is a subgroup of S1, so it's also X some B. And the condition that this only has one fixed point. So it only fixes the superconformal point. refer to this um, condition by the bold letter F and we will say that the theory has property F if this is satisfied. <laughs> so why this? Uh, hmm? um, so necessary for Oh, uh, for this we will define this is actually necessary, I think. And um, later I will say a little bit more whether it's possible to relax this a little bit. So um, from the point of view of getting 3 t t, this seems to be somewhat necessary. But if you relax this, you still have some kind of structure. Maybe not a full 3 t t, but some... Um, other theory where you may not be able to define all partition function, but you may still be able to define some not invariance. So um, for now, let's just make the assumption that we'll be working with theory with property F. And now, um, another remark, maybe we continue from here. Number three is that uh, all this rank one as your stopper theories has this property. And more generally, for higher rank, if you consider a n comma a n theory, then they also have property f if um, m plus one and m plus one are co prime. So you see that in a sense, generically, this property is satisfied. And even they are not co-prime, um, sometimes they also satisfy this property. When this property is satisfied, 
then the claim is that now if you write the, the expression for this, and then if you set t to be a root of unity, so here um, zeta n is e to the 2 pi i over n, the claim is that now this is regularized and is valued in the following field. And you can do actually slightly more than this. So you can allow, you can have an entire family by setting t to be a power of this particular root of unity. And this is still well defined as long as your gamma is co-prime with n. So the n is the group of integers mod n. And the n start denotes the group of integers the multiplicity group of integers mod n. And elements in this group are going to be represented by integers that are co-prime with n mod n. So you see that you have an entire family of uh, partition functions, at least on S3. And then you can ask whether this can help you to regularize any partition functions. And the conjecture is that, yes, it will. And this will be upgraded to an entire Zn star family of 3D TQFTs. Well, that has any meaning? Yeah, that's an extremely good question. So, so far it seems that I have uh, first assumed that t is, uh, has absolute value smaller than one and obtained this expression. And then I just analytically continue to a root of unity. And it's very interesting to understand this procedure uh, from the physics. So it seems that this procedure is about collapsing infinite tower of state into a single one. But what exactly, um, and, and this kind of operation is familiar in some other, um, in, some, um, in, in some other subject. But, but here, um, we don't see, I don't think we have a complete satisfactory answer of what's, what does this regularization process correspond to physically. So it's an extremely interesting question. say a little bit more about 3D TQFTs and then give you some examples. So for many people here, um, you're perhaps already very familiar with the statement about 2D TQFTs. It's a kind of a well-known fact that the data for 2D TQFT is the same as the data that defines a um, commutative for Venus algebra. And there is a corresponding statement for 3D TQFTs. The 
corresponding statement is that the data that define a certain class of 3D TQFTs is equivalent to the data of a moderate tensor category. Moderate tensor categories has already appeared in previous talk. And this line over here is, in a sense, a categorification of the previous line. So if you have some 3D TQFT, you can always obtain a 2D TQFT by reducing this on a circle. And the corresponding operation on the side of more tensor category is that you take the Gordon Dick group of the category. The Gordon Dick of a modern tensor category is sometimes also referred to as the Wollinger ring. And then you will get back a community for Venus algebra. So if you already knew a little bit about community for Venus algebra, or just community algebra, you already have some uh, insights into modern tensor categories. So what I will do now is that I will first um, state a conjecture relating supersymmetric quantum field theories to modern tensor categories. And then I will um, give you a more detailed list of data that define a modern tensor category. So conjecture. So if I'm given a theory T, and this is a super conformal theory, with this property that I denote by bold F, then we conjecture that there will be a family of modular tensor categories that I will denote by C sub T gamma, where gamma is valued in Z n star. And the second part of the conjecture is that you can get, you can obtain at least a category for gamma equals zero, sorry, gamma equals one from geometry of the Coulomb branch. So, uh, so far I have been a little bit vague about how to, well, I've been completely vague about how to get this category from geometry. Later I will say a little bit more about the dictionary between the algebraic data that define more tensor category and the geometric data of the Coulomb branch. So if you manage to reconstruct this category from geometry of MT, then the third part of the conjecture states that you can also get <laughs> CT with more general gamma by doing a Galois transformation on the modern tensor category CT gamma equals one. So now I will try to first say a little bit more about 
what the tensor categories and the algebraic data that define them, and at the same time, give you an example for this particular theory, A1, A2. So you call that for A1, A2, this number n would equal to 5. And Z5 star are going to be represented by integer numbers between 0 and 5 that are co-prime with 5. And so they'll be represented by these four elements. And there will be four um, different MTCs So what is an MTC? Have you already mentioned that a modular tensor category is a... Uh, hmm? So uh, zero does not help to, so you mean gamma equals zero. Zero does not help to regularize, so you won't define um, 3D T craft T because some partition function is still divergent. But you may hope that this still define some category that uh, has less data than MTC. So, but for now, we will assume that it's actually co-prime with N, so that uh, you have a hope of regularizing all partition functions, so you have completely well-defined 3D TQFTs. So, Pepe already mentioned that a model tensor category is a um, C-linear abelian semi-simple category with finite many simple objects, and the starting point of um, the algebraic data that define MTC would first consist of a set, a finite set, gamma, known as the label set, which is identified with the isomorphism classes of simple objects in this um, category. There is a particular special object known as the unit of the MTC. And indeed, on this MTC, there is a fusion product or fusion rule. And the unit is um, the identity under the fusion rule. So the fusion rule will be a map from products of two copies of lambda into non-negative linear combinations of lambda with integer coefficients. So here, um, what is lambda? It turns out that for all these four categories, the label set and the fusion rule are going to be the same. Because, well, Gawa transformation does not um, change the label set, and it will also not change the fusion rule because it only involves integer coefficients. So, lambda will consist of two elements. One is this unit one, and for the other elements, I would denote it by phi. And then the fusion rule will be given by phi times phi equals one plus phi. So since we are in Italy, I would like to mention that sometimes this is referred to as the Fibonacci fusion rule. So if you take actually n copies of phi and then fuse them together, then you will have a decomposition into again one plus phi but with coefficients being the Fibonacci numbers. And a 
model tensor category has a, has a word module in its name. And this is referring to the fact that there is an SL2Z action on the vector space on the C-span of um, lambda. And this data can be represented by S and T matrices. So here, now, the S and T matrices will actually depend on which, uh, which one of the four categories you are talking about. For gamma equals one, S will be given by the following. So you have two over square root of five as the overall factor and minus sine two pi over five sine pi over five and sine pi over five and sine two pi over five. We all know that Fibonacci sequence has something to do with five. And indeed, you see five everywhere. And for the T matrix, it's going to be diagonal in the basis given by the simple objects. And it will look like the following. E to the 11 pi i over 30. E to the minus pi i over 30 and two zeros. And there are some additional pieces of data that enter into the definition of an MTC. These are known as the F and R matrices. This comes from the fact that a modern tensor category is a fusion category, so it has some associator, and that's transformed roughly into the data of the F matrix. And then the R matrix comes from the fact that it's also uh, MTC is braided. So we have already seen R matrices um, on Monday, but R matrices here will be constant R matrices, not the special R matrices that we have seen that depends on additional parameters. So I won't write down all the F and R matrices here, but instead I will just write a particular one. So F, an F matrix is labeled by um, quadruple of uh, simple objects in the category. And for this one, it's given by minus phi i square root of phi minus i phi uh, square root of phi and phi. Here, phi here is really the golden ratio. So why do I want to write down this F matrix? Well, it turns out that this F matrix is not unitary. I'm sorry, what is the first entry in T? Oh, uh, this is E to 11 pi i over 30. particular one is non-unitary. In fact, for this category, it's not possible to make all of the STFR matrices unitary. Here, in this basis, ST matrices are unitary, but this particular F matrix is not unitary. Therefore, we are actually having a non-unitary MTC. 
So this particular MTC has a name. It's sometimes referred to as the Li Yang MTC. And it can be identified with the category of modules of a VOA. And the VOA is known as the Liang model. This is a non-unitary minimal model, sometimes known as the 2,5 minimal model. And uh, this is for gamma equals one. How about the other gammas? So let me make a table here. The allowed value of gamma is one, two, three, and four. And we have four model test categories. And for gamma is one, this is already identified with the young MTC. And for gamma equal to four, it will be something also simple. It will be the complex conjugate of the young MTC. However, for two and three, we got something that is somewhat unexpected. For gamma equals two, you have G2 uh, at level one. So G2 at level one has uh, two integral modules. And they form, um, again, a module has a category. And it's exactly this category for gamma equals to two. For gamma equals three, you will now instead have F4 at level one. Strictly speaking, you have to tensor this with two copies of E8 at level one. And among these five MTCs, these two are going to be non-unitary. And well, these two are actually unitary. So you see that you can get some interesting unitary and non-unitary um, MTCs. This is not um, terribly surprising because although Gawa action um, acts nicely and preserve all the uh, coherence condition that F and R matrix they need to satisfy, it does not preserve um, unitarity of a matrix. So if you have some matrix, some constraints that look like this, this is not algebraic, and this is not going to be preserved by uh, some Galois action. So you can get sometimes unitary theories. But we kind of expect that you, in general, get non-unitary theories. And that is kind of interesting. So recently there has been interest in, from the quantum topology community in non-unitary theories. And hopefully, using this approach, one can obtain some interesting non-unitary theories, not the known one like the Liang model, but some more exotic ones. And hopefully that can shed some light uh, into um, quantum topology. So, um, I think I'm already out of time. But maybe let me just mention one more thing. So I promise to give you um, refinement of part two of the conjecture. The part two conjecture states that you can go from geometric data of the Coulomb branch 
to this data here. But we don't completely understand that yet. So we now have an incomplete dictionary. So let me just write three entries of the dictionary and then stop. So first, for this label set, we expect this to be identified with S1 fixed points on, on the Coulomb branch. It turns out that once this property F is satisfied, the fixed points are discrete and it can perfectly be um, identified with the label set. And then we have the S matrix. And then this is related to the weight of S1 action on the normal bundle. to a particular fixed point, lambda. In writing like this, I have already um, made use of the identification of fixed points and uh, elements in the, in the MTC. And for the T matrix, T matrix the T matrix is going to be diagonal uh, in the basis given by simple objects and this diagonal entry, T lambda lambda, is expected to be related to the value of the moment map of the S1 action at lambda. And obviously this only gave you the first two parts of the data, and then you can ask uh, the first, sorry, one three of the list of data, and then you can ask maybe how to get the fusion rules, how to get F matrix, how to get R matrices. And these are interesting questions that we currently cannot answer. So, but let me stop here and sorry for running over time.